2000. He actually, uh, I think, didn't finish high school, is what I heard. <laughs> and he went to work in Paul Sigler's group when Paul was in, at the University of Chicago. And the trick there is that he was a dishwasher. So how many people are like Trisha and I who started washing dishes in the lab? Look at this, it's a lot of us. So you, you know, the future is bright, right? <laughs> Uh, and then he followed Paul to uh, uh, Yale University and worked with Paul as a postdoc there. And then he has his own lab now at UT Southwestern. So today he's going to talk to us, of course, about HKL 3000 and the, the suite of programs that goes with that. Did you? Thank you. Okay. So HKL 3000 is a superset of HKL 2000. So it's a little start with the functionality of the Data for monetary placement, but what is it? 
In fact, it was surprising to me when I was this is that was shown that the uh, one can sit in the hemisphere, collect the data, so the structure didn't worry too much. And uh, we also very nice with that. So, mm, so the somewhere I'm thinking there's enough filtering logic in various outlier rejections and so on that allows to mm, solve uh, uh, such a structure. And uh, I think this is why we have this discussion here, because the layers of uh, decision making, uh, particularly when we deal with imperfect data, are very complex. So I think it's uh, I will kind of go very quickly over basics because it's uh, uh, there are also a lot of similarities to pro uh, problems and contact, which uh, some even I mentioned, but it's uh, uh, for example what the uh, field mentioned is a very similar type of problems that appear in HKL 2000 simply because it's a very kind of characteristic of the fact that we have to deal with complex patterns and various ambiguities. In fact, it's the same tree of uh, in, in the fixing mosaicity to lower values. Also, lower value also works very well in HKL 2000. And so the critical aspect, of course, the progress one has to define the loop is that which way the rotation axis turns. And in case of fractions, you know, start what are, I mean, what are the uh, directions uh, of the Euronian stuff? Essentially, what is the definition of the Euronian stuff? And what would be always surprising is that the people, what people think and what the reality is, but this is another issue. And for example, when we notice that the zero sensors in Euronian stuff sometimes are in a different position. And so it's a, maybe I am simply getting more such data where people kind of have problems with them at the various stages. But variability of the problems is quite large. So you have a site file where one can specify uh, you know, things like uh, various positions. And I think it's uh, moving towards reading them from um, header. But we have an additional uh, now option in a program. Is the data in the header reliable or not? And this is in the site file. So we know this particular argument writes incorrect information, say, about distance. Then you simply can mark because the data is invalid. And also, kind of the going stuff, this is for single axis going to stuff. If you want the two possible directions, essentially, it's a way of positioning this very certain space, including the single axis could be an arbitrary direction if you can specify it. And the, and the thing is that it's overall, this program I mean, is partially popular because it covers really large different types of instruments, data formats. It can do act as arm calibration of the uh, uh, CCD detector and uh, can work with data which are directly from the CCD detector or transform. It can I mean, both panels, even in fact, it recently was used for neutron crystallography, which was, I was surprised that it worked in the first place in the two day. It's actually the soul. Also works to me with cylindrical uh, detectors. Image plate and still kind of work in a new field, which is kind of how it started. And, uh, and people use it from still photographs to, in one case, 45 degree oscillation, rotation image for <laughs> protein. So, and Mark was. But for imaging, it requires shorter. <laughs> so, it's a, I think the critical issue is, uh, was already discussed, is X and Y mean. And I think now there's an interesting option that you can you know, do automatic search for, for it. It's kind of it's interesting to look at how it would last. And uh, uh, another thing is if you're missing that you get enough problem with the properties is that that doesn't get uh, looks like it's lower symmetry. Essentially, because it's compensates it's called condition by tilting the detector. And uh, the result is that you get uh, this, uh, uh, from here on your final you get the structured lattice if you have missing this. So, if you, one of the signs of poor indexing is that you get higher symmetry, if your crystal is higher symmetry, of course. Another problem is uh, that uh, you should choose the spot size. And uh, this is a case where I mean, there's no problem. We try to default, which is reasonable for a particular detector. But considering kind of more than kind of, kind of this installation, we sometimes make kind of, well, it not very optimal. I found that often uh, uh, struggle with automatic algorithms for finding spot size. And uh, I found something 
my observation was following. That if you if your spots are nicely separated, and if the problem to identify spot size is relatively easy, then it really doesn't matter very much. We try to push it to, to the extremes, being way too large, way too small. The factor was essentially the same. It's a, there was even there was much impact on phasing signal. It was minimal if you, it was if you push things to the extreme back to the small. But uh, overall, the others were very robust. I think what changed is like overall the factor changed a bit. Because it's a, it was missing a bit more of reflection intensity and high resolution if it's making this also small. But I mean, none of the kind of important parameters change much. I mean. so, so that's why it's not. I mean, but the rest of are really close, and this optimization of this parameter is not so easy. Trying to have some idea how to handle that, this can occur in the future. And, okay. So the thing is, it's a, with data collection, you have to remember that it's often with a very different targets. For example, every cruise crystallography to screen events, you don't care about the most accurate section, you want to know if the event is there or not. And then we maybe do something send this particular again uh, more. And for example, those people are much more interested in the calculation being fast and efficient, so large oscillation range is quite acceptable because the, the goal is to screen a large number of compounds presence in, uh, in a potential amount of data. So you don't always, our target is not always the best data quality, or because we do lots of kind of testing for various aspects. And uh, another thing is that this uh, with radiation damage corrections that in various uh, beam experiments is not uh, necessary, but it still may be used. Except that one has to kind of convey the message to the program what was the exposure at particular acquisition. It's just a program assumes that the frames were exposed uh, consecutively, and maybe we should kind of somehow discover it from time stamps or. or Another kind of aspect which is already kind of mentioned that when we sometimes want to reorient crystal for a particular experiment, it's a, it's, if we have reaction learning stuff. So, for example, to cover a missing cone or mm, to collect a back to back simultaneously. And uh, so we have kind of some of different type of uh, data collection strategy, essentially, which is to, uh, this is the maximum coverage. And you can uh, ask the question as well to kind of total oscillation range. You get each particular level of coverage if you start the particular point. So it's somewhere, it's, it's, it's probably best to start somewhere here, where you get, where you relatively soon hit somewhere to complete coverage. So it's kind of maybe a bit kind of complex to read, but it's, it's maybe useful. But this plot unfortunately doesn't take into account the possibility of a, uh, Overlaps, uh, uh, so then we have to run kind of more precise simulations, which will tell you, oh, then we have some uh, mm -hmm. overlaps, and then you may have to adjust, let's say, oscillation range or the oscillation step you know, within a frame, and uh, if you have a parameter, it's maybe distance to, to, to get overlap. So we can't mention the spot size for the matter because overlap calculation is based on particular size of the spot. Another thing is that you can simulate. Uh, Decay of the crystal, but this is it assumes that you know intensity of the beam, which is kind of, I mean, I'm not sure how easy it is to get this information with proper calibration. So, and then you can have a slide there, and the intensity will kind of go down as you, as you progress. Okay, another possibility is that you can calculate uh, mm, completeness if you already have some data set collected before. So, if you Want to kind of increase uh, the and, uh, in orientation of uh, uh, the index, but the thing is that uh, it will not work in all aspects because we have to know the relative orientation. But this uh, will still kind of probably work a bit on more on that aspect. Okay. So crystal orientation. This is if you want to have say micro pairs on a um, particular axis. Unfortunately, only find examples that align. Such use of a program for small, for small molecules, but approaches unique. Calculations are really the same. So essentially, you have this many crystal alignment, and you can choose the brightness of angles, which will, and, and if the instrument is connected to the brightness that can even drive it to the brightness of There are a few kind of options which are used only in some circumstances, like inline control. 
Okay, so scaling was already discussed quite a lot. So we have essentially our various statistics. We, we, we can see, for example, the crystal spike and isotropic. Okay, it's good. But otherwise, I think we're fine. So, I was actually going to Automatic correction was already discussed. So, I'll just keep it. And the spatial determination also, okay. So, spatial determination, okay, there's an additional option, which I didn't discuss before, that we have to, press the program lattice button. If you push it, we will get a display of the spot intensity and the pseudo precession type photograph. And uh, but with respect to the unique part of asymmetric unity, because this is based on already marriage intensity. So you can look at, in fact, if you see, say, patterns of systematic absences, like it's one to one. But, but the problem is that you have to select here a scale of P2 to 2.2. So for, for the sake of uh, actual reflection, needs to be rejected. Okay. <coughs> so this is uh, not an unusual case where the difference in merging statistics for bifurcate separate and bifurcate merge and bifurcate merge are really different. So this is goodness of the statistics. So something makes it the, the makes the bifurcate disagreeing between this is that more than the, uh, each of them kind of freedom is separately. So if you see a large difference, okay, that's all, most of the time it's a large phasing signal, unless something else can kind of simulate it, but it's very, very rare. And uh, such a structure is solved very, very easily. Kind of, uh, this is kind of more challenging type of case where the difference emerging statistics between bifold set and, and bifold pairs together is very small. This is the uh, difference for each observation uh, Observation at time, so it's not a, a marriage reflection. It's a, so this difference kind of gets multiplied to, by a with list of observations so if you have ten times. So essentially, this is one tenth increase. You need about ten times the multiplicity to get the into by a factor of two higher. A factor of two higher means that another signal is roughly one to one signal to noise. So it's a, so this is kind of something which is a very limit. But another such case, self self, because this is a self self case, uh, extends fairly high resolution because of the uh, form factor for another scattering is essentially flat, so it doesn't go down the resolution like form factor for real scattering. Okay, so that's the solution. So, the um, program uses shell uh, V, and uh, kind of in this case, it's a correlation coefficient is 45. And interestingly enough, this is rather low correlation coefficient than we <coughs> use in HK3000. Let's say you can kind of correlation coefficient around 50 from FLXD from SAT to AZ are rather typical. And uh, maybe it is slightly lower for server SAT. But it's a, so it's a, and this, this is because of some. Uh, there is fairly good selection of which reflections are informative to be used to, for um, um, analog scattering. So typically, you don't select a, you use the whole resolution range, but with a filter inside for informative reflection and to analog signal. So there is a, there's no need to adjust the resolution which uh, 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 sites I found, and we simply follow it by shell X to E to identify elements of the solution because it's, uh, we may have the solution uh, always in various. And we look at the, the, mm, the concept statistics and in various solutions here is much, poor, is much poorer than the, the, the original solution so you know that we don't have to invert the solution. And this is the case where kind of from shell X C, we didn't have spectacular uh, Signal to noise for this in this case. This is self And some kind of, uh, kind of uh, problem which can also give us some problems in terms of various limitations. But uh, finally, it's where uh, it was uh, from self uh, So from the senior sub, I mean, it's kind of one of the nice uh, 
eventually looking at arrangements of atoms, but there were all kinds of structures which were solved within um, HK of 3000, and some of the options, which is, in fact, I haven't used even them, but because they were developed by one lab, are uh, related to ligand placement, and uh, it can, if you have some libraries of ligands, it can try to place them in various orientations. I think it's based on the resolve and uh, ability to place uh, atoms. And uh, there's also an um, automatic uh, feeding of uh, ligands made from a particular library. Another part is uh, um, molecular replacement, which is based <coughs> on molecular, and uh, which uh, works quite often, but uh, sometimes uh, the molecular replacement program becomes somewhat more challenging. So it's not the most elaborate uh, in terms of uh, possibilities, because somehow uh, we believe that it's a choice of a um, model for molecular replacement in the end much more than how we do molecular replacement. And uh, um, because it's in a sense, if you, you can predict or build with a model that needs to be discussed. And it's, okay, more options, which is essentially refinement or refinement. I have a feeling that some people unnecessarily do mm -hmm. molecular replacement in situations where isomorphous replacement would be perfectly suitable, which is a quite a lot of structures in PDB have the same kind of the units that are close enough for usual refinement and normal refinement to continue. And this is kind of quite typical of the ligand structures. Okay. So I'm going to finish this part, which is really kind of lots of people, a lot of people that are programs were helpful interacting with us. And so I'd like to show kind of how it works and kind of practice on. Unfortunately, this has to be a relatively easy case, simply for the reason that it's the amount of time for the presentation is short. So, and unfortunately, I have to look at the screen. Okay, 
The problem is it's, uh, I'm not used to this uh, graphic display. Now the only thing we have to define is that the uh, project is
Okay, so this is, you can see, this was, this was scaled G2. And you can see there are nice systematic absences along with the k-axis. Yes. Mm -hmm. so Yeah. <laughs> 